I'm here with Ileana Goldberstein, who, well, welcome everyone. We have, a, as compared to our earlier panels, we have uh, a lot of us in this one. So I'm Gavin, I'll be your moderator for this session. Now I'm just gonna go around the room and introduce everyone. And this will just be first names only because we're talking as consumers here. So we've got firstly, Nancy from New Zealand, uh, alliteration, and that's good to see. We've got Asa from Thailand. Uh, we've got Chuggy from India, and then we have Clarice from the Philippines, and we have Steph, uh, as you can tell from my accent, from <laughs> Australia as well. So <laughs> welcome, everyone. Great to have you in this consumer advocacy panel. Now, firstly, I'm going to go to Clarice and uh, ask you, Clarice, to just outline in terms of consumer advocacy, what it means for you, because we saw in the lead up to this uh, segment, just how critical it is, particularly there in the Philippines. Okay, um, hi Gavin, hi everyone. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, I'm Clarice. Uh, I'm a consumer advocate for THR in the Philippines and uh, I've been working with CAFRA I think since its inception <laughs> and um, we've been heavily involved in educating, advocating and making sure that adult alternative nicotine consumers' voices are heard so that THR products are and will remain accessible and will not be covered by arbitrary policies. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can keep going. Okay. You can go keep going, going okay. Clarice. Um, uh, in the Philippines, uh, fighting for our rights to have these products accessible and to have fair regulations uh, hasn't really been the easiest. But uh, thanks to collective efforts of our consumer groups like the Vapors PH and uh, Nicotine Consumers Union of the Philippines, um, as well as industry groups like uh, PESHA, um, we were able to develop strategies and organize forums and attend and provide inputs in congressional hearings. Um, it is of utmost importance that we are able to let our policymakers know the plight of consumers so that they can take into account our lives in creating and deciding on these policies. Uh, sometime in November last year, the Philippine government have tried to ban the use of e-cigarettes, HTPs, and other smoke-free alternatives. We have even seen our police force confiscate hundreds of vapes due to the order of banning these THR products. But with our active discussion with lawmakers, we now have laws that regulate these products, specifically RA11346 and RA11467, which um, delve into taxing THR products along with combustible cigarettes and liquor. This year, with the happening of the pandemic, the Philippine government has imposed a community quarantine in March which has, uh, I must say, uh, impeded access to THR products since the Enhanced Community Quarantine, or what we call here uh, ECQ, has put in place strict restrictions in terms of opening stores as well as deliveries and even manufacturing. While the community quarantine has slightly eased and more and more businesses have started to reopen now, uh, I've noticed that uh, vape shops have initiated to start to shift to bringing their businesses online to comply with safety and health, health protocols. Um, recently, another bill is also being discussed in Congress and uh, that will specifically regulate e-cigarettes and HTPs. While uh, this is a good head start for consumers like me, uh, it is still a long road ahead and we need to continue pushing for fair regulations and accessibility of THR products. We have to make sure that people who have made the switch as well as those who still are smoking should not be deprived of their right to choose. E-cigarettes and HTPs uh, remain to be perceived as hazardous here. And I think 
almost everywhere. And uh, we'd like to change that negative perception by raising more awareness on these products through uh, disseminating accurate information based on scientific evidence. The Philippines has one of the largest populations of smoke smokers, uh, roughly 15.9 million. And um, if we can change that by encouraging people who smoke to shift to THR products, will not only uh, make these people's lives better, but will also make the world a much better place for everyone. Um, I remain hopeful that health authorities in the country and even in other countries will keep to have an open mind in terms of working with the scientific community and private sectors as well as consumer groups so that we can be uh, all in the same footing when it comes to setting standards and regulations that will be beneficial for all but uh, in particular of course smokers who need to quit combustible cigarettes and shift to reduced risk products um Thank you for the uh, opportunity to share these insights with you. And I would like to apologize in advance for not being able to make it to the Q&A because I have a class. <laughs> and uh, I, if you wish to reach me, you may reach me at my Twitter. It's uh, CY Verhino. Thank you and have a happy weekend, everyone. Well, thank you very much, uh, Clarice, thank and you. thank you for taking time out of your uh, daily life to try and do this. So thank you very much. Thank you. you know, we know that all advocates are actually um, giving all their time to a lot of this. So, uh, yes, thank you very much. And I'll move on to one of our other uh, panel members for the moment. So I'll cut to you, Asa. Uh, now, Asa being from Thailand, you have faced some particularly challenging circumstances as well, um, given the regulations in your part of the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in Thailand, uh, it started many, many years, well, three or three, four or five years ago that uh, uh, someone high up there, the, the, probably the ex -prime, the prime minister back then just wanted to to put a crash on Chicha because uh, he saw that it's a threat to youth and it's straight out and uh, somehow they just included electronic cigarettes into the same categories as chicha and things have been spiraled downhill since then. Uh, one of the problem is it started, the law started with the Ministry of Commerce, you know, banning the importation, manufacturing and distribution. And of course, this has to do with commercial on, on a commercial scale. But then again, uh, that same law was uh, evoked uh, and replaced by other laws that came out by the Department of Custom. So it's the importation uh, also included in that category is our manufacturing and distribution. And of course, you know, you cannot vape where, where it's uh, smoking is not allowed. Uh, the problem arises that uh, there are many officials that distorted this these laws and try to arrest and well not try to they had arrested many users and uh, and regular people out of uh, possessions why in fact possessions really is not in any kind of law that that is illegal so it's kind of really weird situation going on and uh, you know i i can say it right here that you know one of the thing that that it brought about was uh, corruption because you know possession is it's not illegal you know you can own and unless you know if you wave in a no no smoking zone then there's a five thousand baht fine that's it and and of course we're not talking about the importation or manufacturing or distribution which uh, there's a separate law about that possession actually in itself it is not illegal at all but people get arrested and was asked for a fine for um up to two hundred thousand baht well, that, and, and, but, and have but, you found yeah have you have you found that asa in terms of your advocacy um to the authorities given that um they they've been quite um straightforward in trying to move against uh vaping 
have you gone with your advocacy? Have you been able to um, have other vapors uh, take up these issues? Uh, yeah, we have we have some helps. Uh, this is this is really something really difficult because Thai people are mainly you know their their upbringing and our root are mm. uh, afraid of the the uh, the older generation of people in higher authority. And so, you know, uh, most people, when we try to convince them, you know, just to come out and sign petitions and things like that, they were afraid that they were going to get arrested for, I mean, we've been trying to say that, hey, you're not going to get arrested just for signing petition. But they say, no, 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 the police is going to come and, and raid our house, which, which I kept saying that, you know, hey, it's not going to happen. It, it you know, it, it cannot be, they, they cannot raid your house just because of suspicion that you own a web gear, you know, you have something like this and, and police is going to come in. But it's very difficult to convince people. Otherwise, they'd say, hey, come out and help us. Of course, there are many people, you know, I'm, I'm really thankful for that. We have at least half a million vapors in the country who are, who are in the country. And that there's still quite some people that, that are willing, but not enough really uh, so it's it's really difficult. It's unlike all other countries that you know people get together, come out, and you know uh, with rallies and and join together, showing signs and things like that. But Thai people are really really afraid to come out. But uh, we have been talking to a lot of uh, government people, you know, the, a lot of uh, representative, and most of them agree with us. Said you know we should do something. We should lift the ban. So, you know, that, that's still hope. I, I can say that there is still hope. And Asa, is it just a, quickly, is there a, uh, is the Tobacco Control Agency there uh, pushing for these bans as well or the, this regulation? Yep. They, they, are the, they are the main people who are pushing for the bans and want to maintain the ban and they just don't care about the, the scientific result researchers and and everything in between, you know, they just interpret the scientific uh, results. Like, you know, if there, there are some researchers come out with, with 10 results, both good and bad, of course, everything that's good and bad. So, you know, if there are two negative things to, to say about vaping, they'll just use that too. And the other good, other eight benefits, they just ignore mm -hmm. it. And it had always been that way since, you know, since, since, since it began. Right. So, yeah. It's, it's well, thank you very much, Arsa. So I'll I'll now turn to uh, Juggy from India. Uh, Juggy, you've I'm guessing that you, as as a group of uh, vapors in India, uh, you would have found it uh, as advocates. Has it been? Have you been able to uh, advocate uh, successfully, or at least get a group together as as vapors and talk about the issues you have? Yeah. Uh... <clears throat> We've been uh, we've been struck with this ban for uh, a little over a year now, uh, where personal consumption has been permitted, and that was clarified by the Minister of Health itself. But uh, like uh, Asa also mentioned, you know, manufacture, transport, import, everything has been banned. In fact, uh, we are even banned from carrying it on aircrafts now, and that's the uh, scenario that we are presented with in India. When it comes to advocacy efforts, uh, we do have uh, unique situations wherein a lot of our uh, vapors are, you know, young youth and probably even their families don't know that they used to smoke and they have migrated to vaping. And so we have those kinds of challenges wherein they are not willing to come out and that fear exists because uh, it's illegal and the tom toming of it being illegal is uh, doing overtime in the press. But that being said, we have been uh, able to get a, a group of uh, committed individuals who are pushing for this. In fact, we uh, had an online protest uh, just a couple of days ago on the, you know, the one year of the ban. We organized it online because of, uh, you know, uh, your social distancing uh, issues with uh, COVID going on. And we were able to put up a good presence. We were able to write to uh, you know, all the members of parliament that's in session and trying to uh, get them to listen to the voice of reason. Uh, and uh, 
look at science in the way science is supposed to be interpreted rather than cherry picked uh, approaches which they have been following thus far that's a, that's an excellent point uh, jaggi and this this is something which uh, as a as a group have you found uh, with the the challenges that are present in this kind of covid period um, it seems like you've been able to effectively organize is that is you know is that a rewarding part of being an advocate because ultimately um, you know you it seems that you're being successful despite challenging circumstances oh yes indeed it's 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 extremely rewarding and heartwarming when you find people willing to still come out and uh, put forward their points of view and their perspectives and still standing up out there to say that this is something uh, that has indeed saved our lives every vapor has a story right uh, and a successful one because we have all come from tobacco in one form or the other uh, either smoking or chewing or one of those and uh, vaping has saved all our lives it's just that we need to get our message across and our stories across and it's very nice when we find people coming forward and holding up banners and talking about mm -hmm. how it has affected them and why uh, the government really needs to relook at uh, their uh, you know uh, blind uh, sided policies of banning it without uh, really having a debate in this matter that's what we have been pushing for yeah yeah now i'll move on to you steph um given that you are uh i think like me located in the city of melbourne and as such <laughs> uh you are just on that point of covid 19 restrictions um yes. facing um, some challenging circumstances in organising. Um, how have you how have you found it in terms of organising uh, and working towards kind of positive change with others? Sure. So I'm sure there'd be lots of people on this call tonight um, acutely aware of the uh, struggles that Australia is going through right now in terms of uh, you know how we were about to have our health minister place this rule that you know it would be vape importing nicotine liquid would be banned and we'd be fined two hundred and twenty thousand dollars and border force would you know if we were found to have been importing it they'd take it um i'm very i'm acutely aware that i'm a glass half full type of person and what i must say is i mean as someone who quit smoking via vaping um it, it was like the anxiety of the potential for me not to be able to get those products very much personally uh, snapped me into action. But I think what was particularly heartening, you know, especially during a pandemic, was to see those old organising principles of anger, hope, action really sparking people into action. And mostly these were people that had never considered, you know, publicly sharing their story before. So in a way, I found that really heartening, um, particularly in a pandemic where, you know, things like rallies or pickets or, uh, you know, appearing outside of MPs' offices, all of those tools were taken away from us. Uh, but the really positive way in which social media was utilised, I found that really heartening. I found that really heartening and I also think it gave a lot of people confidence to share their story where maybe before if we'd asked them to rock up to an MP's office or, you know, go to the media or something like that, maybe they wouldn't have done that. So I think this was a really great first step for a lot of people. And I know that... Uh... The ASA talked earlier about having 500,000 vapors across uh, Thailand. Um, I think there was actually in Australia, there was a recent kind of revision of the figures. It, it, I think, is it over 500,000 in Australia now or at least estimated to be? At least estimated to be, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and in terms of, did, was there movement, did you feel that your campaigns had a real effect? Because I do know that the, the government has changed its plan several times do you think that that movement had a direct effect in, in terms of you know mobilizing vapors and actually them then taking action and the government responding to that i absolutely do and um i'm very much someone who obviously I, you know facts reason all of those tools in your tool belt as an activist are really important but 
I think there is something uh, quite moving about someone who has smoked for 20 years writing an email to an MP saying, if you take this away from me, I will go back to smoking and I will die. Um, certainly that became very present for me. That's certainly a, the main reason why I quit smoking. I had someone in my family out of nowhere develop cancer and I became acutely aware of my mortality. And what I love about that tool is that, you know, we know in this, you know, new age of fake news that you can go to people with logic and reason and facts and they will still come back with you and say, no, I don't believe it. But the moment people are brave enough or perhaps scared enough that vaping will be taken away from them to share their story, no one can argue with someone's truth. Like an MP or someone like that cannot turn around and say, that didn't happen, that's not true. So absolutely, yes, I do, I do think that. Excellent, and, and that takes me back to the presentation we had from Jenna Fedolino, who was talking about this very thing. Mm -hmm. um, an excellent presentation, thanks Jenna Fedolino. Now, talking about someone who's impressive, uh, I'm gonna hand over to Nancy uh, from New Zealand, who uh, has worked in this consumer advocacy um, gig for some time, as, as we saw in the opening segment. Now, Nancy, how, how has it been there in New Zealand? It seems to me that there actually is a very strong grassroots consumer advocacy work being done there, and it seems that it's actually made a change. Well, I, the thing is, I feel like odd man out here. You know, I'm, I'm the only one sitting here with looking towards legalization and not going to be thrown in jail. Um, we started this in 2015 and it was a group of us in Wellington and it was the threat of it being, you know, treated like smoking in Wellington City. And from there, it kind of exploded. What we did is we created, we built a community. And I think that that probably is 90 percent of why we've had the success that we have. Um, because in that community, you know, people went and, and, and we humanized it. You know, we said we went and spoke to MPs and we went and spoke to health authorities. And we said, hey, listen, you know, for example, I smoke for 30 years. You know, I vape, take my blood pressure, take an X-ray. You know, it. we humanized it. And I think that had a lot to do with why New Zealand was able to be able to get to the point where it's at now. I mean, yes, we have regulations. Yes, they're not perfect but they beat a ban and we know that. Um, so we're sitting in a very strange place with the rest of Asia Pacific at this point, because we're the ones that are going to have probably the first one to have a proper regulatory framework in the region. And we know we have to get it right because we know that we will be the precedent in the region. So that puts us in a very interesting position, I guess you could say. Um, as far as the media, I wanted to also touch on Jenna too. <laughs> Sorry, bringing Jenna back into this. Um, what we did, and, and, and this is something that goes out to everybody out there in the audience that's a consumer advocate. What we did is we hit people hard and fast. Um, the New Zealand media is like any other media, I presume. Um, they only do the negative stuff because it's sensationalism. It's, you know, the, the emotive thing. But we still hit them hard and fast and we hit them with facts. And we did the same thing with the ministry. We did the same thing with MPs. We, we you know, trudged the halls of the beehive, giving people information. I mean, the previous um, government, the previous um, head of the Ministry of Health thought that nicotine was carcinogenic. And this guy was a GP. You'd think he'd know better, but he didn't. Um, you know, so Jan and I would give people, you know, reams of scientific information. And of course, we'd have to put it, you know in understandable terms for them. You know, it, it was, there was a lot of work involved to get to the point that we're at. And it wasn't just us. It was a team effort with the scientists and researchers and everything else. So yeah, we're in a very interesting position to say the least. Now the, for those people who are not um, from the Australian, New Zealand bubble, I'll just mention that the beehive is actually a, a real place. It's not an actual beehive. Uh, it's, it's the House of Parliament uh, in New Zealand. And yeah. the other thing is when uh, Nancy's talking about hitting people hard and fast, she's not talking about literally um, hitting people No, hard I'm not talking fast. about she's just on them. I'm just, talking about rebuttals in the media about negative things, yes. Exactly. Just as, as Jenna talked about earlier, that, that timeliness is actually crucial. So Nancy yeah. uh, points to something which is extremely important because we get this uh, a lot in this space and it seems that you have all faced this which is uh getting misinformation seems to um, be a constant battle for you as advocates uh and so how what are some of the 
strategies that you recommend? I'll start with you, Juggy, because you, in India, it seems that you've got one of the, the biggest challenges. How, how do you combat some of that um, misinformation? Well, uh, the one thing that uh, we are indeed doing is uh, have a constant monitor on everything that gets printed because we have it in all forms, right? Uh, we have it on mm-hmm. social media, we have it on print and, and 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 all over the internet and so on. So we do have uh, someone who is doing it on a constant monitoring basis and then we start picking and choosing and we have been distributing it amongst ourselves as to who is going to form a rebuttal for this. And we have a group that looks into, uh, you know, uh, the various aspects that have been covered and we try to put out uh, rebuttals as quickly as possible. Now, uh, one has to admit that uh, the the press aren't very happy to publish rebuttals <laughs> as, as good as they are, as happy as they are to, you know, blackball uh, something uh, which is pretty much towing the government's line on what the ban is and the justifications. But that is something that we have been trying to focus on and uh, drive back. And this is one of the strategies that we have been trying at least to at least combat misinformation. Mm. And Asa, how do you find that in uh, Thailand, particularly given that you've got some of the regulatory authorities or at least the quit um, authorities there trying to, in effect, uh, aim for e-cigarettes rather than focusing on tobacco smoking itself? So how, how do you find that? trying to battle the misinformation that you come across? Well, yeah, just to to answer really bluntly, I have to rephrase what Jackie just said. You know, we have a rebuttal for almost every misinformation that came out and will come out. And we are going, uh, one way is through the office of Ombudsman, which, which will help a lot. And also, we also had heard that... Uh, Probably half of the people of the uh, people in the parliament vape, so that would that would, that will probably be a big help. And you know, we, we are trying to find the best. We really need to get uh, to be together. We need to come together. We need voices, especially from the consumers. You know, just mm-hmm. to come out and and say, hey, you know, stop with the lies, stop with the the misinformation. We know the truth. We we need to we we need to keep hitting them with the word. We know the truth. Stop lying to us and and things like that. So you know, I'm really shouting out for especially for people in Thailand, you know, to come and join us. You know, only only a few of us will not make it happen. But if all of you come out and and join us and tell them, say, stop lying. You know, and uh, excuse me for for speaking it in, in Thai, but พวกเราครับได้เวลาแล้วครับที่เราจะออกมาช่วยกันเราเห็นแล้วว่าทุกคนตอนเนี้ยคนทั่วโลกเนี่ยเขาก็พยายามที่จะช่วยเราอยู่เราจะไม่ช่วยตัวเองเลยครับเราออกมาช่วยกันออกมาช่วยกันส่งเสียงบอกทางรัฐบาลทางคนที่ต่อต้านเราว่าหยุดโกหกได้แล้วเราต้องมาช่วยกันนะครับเนี่ย thank you with that and your your Thai is much better than mine um, Arthur, uh, the that's where. And if you do want to speak in uh, a local language, by the way, that is, that is most welcome because we do have uh, a lot of people out there viewing across the world. Um, in fact, I, I get messages on my phone right now from um, different friends uh, across the globe. So, if you do want to speak, particularly to your um, some of your supporters, now that brings up the point that it is uh, something which we uh, talk about advocacy. And a lot of people who who look at the work that advocates do think that you run uh, broad-reaching, well-funded, uh, <laughs> many staff organisations. Is is that really the truth? Because I see that um, portrayed in the media where people say, here's these vaping groups who, say, yeah, they just they've got so much money, and they they <laughs> seem to be. You know, funded, and they seem to be doing all this work. Look at them; they're everywhere. Now, that Again, I think is testament to your work. But is that the truth? No, um, I think what they what they underestimate is the fact that um, the consumers, because they're the stakeholders, they are not dumb. Um, you know, when I decided I was going to 
go for vaping, I did my research. And they just presume because I don't have a scientific degree, I don't know what I'm doing or what I'm saying. Uh, one of the things that we encountered or I have encountered in dealing with a lot of government officials is they're kind of shocked that, you know, they see me, you know, 50 year old me walking in there. They expect somebody, you know, with 15,000 tattoos and a thousand, you know, piercings looking like, you know, your average bogan, which I don't know how to explain bogan, but you know, whatever hipster. And then they see me walk in there with Jan, you know, these two 50 year old middle-aged ladies walking in there with, with reams of information. And between the two of us, we've got five university degrees. They're like, Whoa, what's this? Um, I think we underestimate ourselves. I think, that a lot of the time it's a confidence issue. It's also a fear issue like a saw brought up. But I also think they don't realize that we all talk to each other, you know, just like they all talk to each other and their little scientific, you know, research little hubs. We all talk to each other. I mean, that's the whole point of CAFRA is we support each other. So if I find a piece of research that's relevant for everybody, I share it with everybody and everybody does the same thing because there's power in numbers. And I don't, th I think they, they severely underestimate the power of the people because you know one of the things that hasn't been touched upon and i presume that clive will bring this up in his presentation is you know as consumers we are stakeholders we have a right to be involved in the process a lot of governments in asia pacific exclude the consumer exclude the general public and that goes against what they've signed up for when they signed up for the UN and when they signed up for the framework convention of tobacco control, they don't think we know that they're beginning to realize that we know more than they think we know. And that is a threat to them. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they come out with these things, all oh, your tobacco company shills, or, you know, mm -hmm. you've got all this money or I'm running an empire, you know, it, that's why, because they wouldn't be able to do what we did unless they did have millions of dollars in funding from pharmaceutical companies and grants and things like that. So they're judging us based on their parameter. Yeah. And that's something which, um, as advocacy groups, uh, and, and I'll, I'll cut to you, Steph, do you, is, is this something which um, you really, is it, you know, is it a grassroots Movement from what I've seen of, of consumer advocacy groups, it really is consumers banding together um, to try and get a whole range of things um, happening. Is that the case? Absolutely. Absolutely. And to be honest, I think that sort of movement, although uh, it's more difficult, uh, it, and I don't know if I'm speaking for everyone on the panel, but in my experience, uh, it would be easier. Honestly, it would be a hell of a lot easier for all of us to take money and be well-funded campaigns. But in terms of the true, the true, um, the true effect of what, the life-changing effect too of something like legalising vaping would have, particularly in Australia where we know that, you know, tobacco continues to be the leading cause of cancer in Australia. It's 22% of the cancer burden. Um, we know that tobacco smoking affects our most vulnerable, people who are on New Start, which is our welfare payment. A pack a day smoker will spend 68% of their welfare check on cigarettes. I mean, these, these are real stories of real people. And I just think that just the sheer power of story, the sheer power of solidarity, not just in my own country, but across all of CAFRA, it is so, so much more powerful. Um, we know that politicians, uh, they respond certainly in a more meaningful and prolific way when they hear those stories uh, because, and I, I would like to believe it's because they're moved, not just because they're afraid of losing votes in an upcoming election. So certainly, I think it is it is so much more powerful, um, a lot more work, but it's so much more meaningful, so much more meaningful. Now, I should mention that we're getting actually quite a few very uh, well-informed and interesting uh, questions through the comments function, um, and I see them coming in. So thank you for all your questions out there. Now, we can't go in depth into all of them right now, but certainly uh, you're welcome to get in touch with CAFRA, you know, the people who are putting on this. Uh, conference and the other thing is you also can get in touch with your consumer advocacy group in your country sometimes a little bit hard there are some countries where it is hard to uh, find your local consumer group however uh, if you get in touch with CAFRA it will be uh, a little bit easier now particularly um, I'm getting some questions about other countries in the region and also we're getting questions around how do we how do we speed up governments when they're looking at uh, 
um, these alternatives. You know, how do we speed up government? How do we how do we work with government? How do we influence government? Now, that comes to the work that you've all been doing, sometimes positively, sometimes effective negatively. Um, Jogi, do you see uh, any any ability to speed up government or work with government in India at the moment? It is. Uh... It's a long drawn out process, okay? Uh, it doesn't uh, come that easily, but uh, you got to understand that uh, it is not something that can be done overnight, but you got to keep the good fight going. Now, just as Nancy said, uh, while you do have these pockets of groups that are all professionals in inverted commas who have these focus, now we are probably the only group that comes from a multitude of professions. Okay, now you have doctors, engineers, scientists, uh, architects, the works, and each one of us have the same story and we come from the common team. That is something that is to be understood by the government. And we are probably the most representative lot of people who should be uh, spoken to when deciding such policy. This is the kind of message that we need to get across and not uh, people who have got uh, this narrow uh, approach in looking into what sciences and so on because we are the consumers. Just as Nancy said, uh, you know, uh, we're not paid. Uh, none of us are. Uh, we are all here because we believe in this and uh, our organizations run on donations. We don't get, uh, we don't get uh, big fat uh, sums of money to, to spend. Uh, each one of us is doing this voluntarily because we believe in this cause and we, because we believe what worked for us should be available to everyone out there. And that's what we are all driving at. And this message should go across, uh, you know, to the policy makers and to, in India's case, to understand that they have erred in this decision. And so it is ongoing. Uh, uh, we have not seen light at the end of the tunnel, uh, but we hope to see that soon. Now, what, in terms of uh, the, Nancy, other, other countries within the region, such as Indonesia, um, mm -hmm. does CAFRA uh, then work with consumer groups consumer advocacy throughout the region, even, even where there are perhaps not a, a local group, and in particular in places like Indonesia, where Indonesia is such a vast country um, with so many different cultural groups and uh, particular areas. You know, so do you work with a range of groups or, or do you just you provide some support? How, how does that work? Well, we do have a group in Indonesia and we also have a group in Malaysia. Um, we have people that we're talking to in Vietnam, people in Korea. I mean, we've got people all around the region. And if an advocate contacts us from a country that isn't represented by a consumer group, we definitely support them. I mean, we've got people in Hong Kong before there was a group in Hong Kong. We supported them with all of their submissions. I mean, the thing about CAFRA is CAFRA is about everybody in the region. So even if something is going on in a country that doesn't have a consumer group, CAFRA is still in there making a submission if there's a submission to be made. And we're in there supporting them. And all the groups in CAFRA support everybody. We all support each other. We're like one big family, you know. Um, so it, it, it it's... It's an issue of building each other up because the more of us, like I said before, the more that are there, that's a powerful force. So, you know, if there's anybody out there that, you know, hey, you're interested in advocacy and there isn't a group in your country, just, you know, send a message, admit at CAFRAorg.net and, you know, we'll get back to you and we'll work with you and see what we can do. And the thing that's interesting about Asia Pacific, especially, is that you've got all these different countries, like you said, with the different regions and different government systems and different ideas about things. Um, it makes it interesting. But what we found is like, for example, things that are going on in India, some of those things translate sort of to what's going on in Thailand. And some of the things that are going on in New Zealand translate to the stuff that's going on in Korea. So you can't think of it in terms of, oh, this country does this. It, it's all interrelated. It really is. Um, things that, you know, science that comes out of Australia, and I'm sure Steph knows this, you know, the Malaysians and the Indonesians and the, and the Thai people, you know, they look at Australia as their example. They don't look at New Zealand. They look at Australia. So that's why it's so important for New Zealand to do it right so that it kind of puts pressure on Australia to Australia to do it right. So then it's all right for Malaysia and Indonesia and Thailand, you know. So everything is interrelated. Yeah. And that's something which I'll just remind everyone who's watching out there that we, we have, and I, I see those messages coming in from Africa, uh, Europe and others. So welcome to everyone who's watching all across the world, uh, particularly shout out to who was watching in 
Kenya. But we have uh, people who have a range of questions. Now, there is a Zoom room that will be available after our presentations tonight, so you'll get in. There will be, that information will be across the bottom of the screen as we get closer to the end, and it also will be pasted, put up into the uh, comments, the chat function. So you will be able to get into that Zoom room uh, and ask further questions and get in touch with us. Now, there'll be, there'll be across the region, you were saying this, Nancy, that uh, we look to each other's countries as, as opportunities or, or ways to um, see the, how we can work towards better regulation and in fact, um, enabling vapors and support for vapors. Now, Jogi, I'll cut to you. You, your work um, just recently, I think it was an anniversary of the ban uh, mm -hmm. in India and you had that protest. Did you get much uh, media out of that or much support for your efforts around the, the that year long, yeah. uh, that basically that ban? Yeah, we actually did. Uh, we, we did get uh, pretty decent uh, media coverage on that one. The story has been picked up uh, by uh, quite a few uh, print houses. Uh, in fact, a few of us were even called for interviews and they did uh, run through some interviews with us on this ban. Uh, we did it in uh, a couple of uh, uh, approaches. We also used that opportunity of the ban to write to all the 500 members of parliament uh, because the parliament session was just starting up to remind them that uh, our uh, our cause needs attention. And uh, we also did have uh, a funvocacy. This is an event that we have live on YouTube uh, every alternate week. And uh, we did invite uh, a few people to talk about their uh, own trials and tribulations and what their thoughts were on this ban and so on. So we have had uh, pretty decent traction and these things are getting picked up by uh, you know, the media right now. But uh, Talking about it, uh, when we did the World Wave Day uh, you know, protest a couple of months ago, uh, we did uh, create incredible amount of uh, traction amongst the, uh, the vapors as well as in the media. So Great. things like this is what we really need to focus upon as for ex like uh, you know, the coalition out here in Asia Pacific uh, with CAFRA, we really need to ensure that as a group, we all need to be together uh, and uh, have our voices collectively heard so that we do get picked up. Uh, well, that's a perfect, a perfect note to end on, Jogi. And, and uh, I thank all of you, uh, and particularly uh, the best of uh, luck, and, and particularly with the work that you do is very important as advocates, as we can see by the comments and questions that are coming in. Uh, I know that we'll have a lot. So thank you very much, all of you, for coming along to answer the questions tonight. And we'll come now to our next segment. Thank you.